Hello and welcome to our presentation this evening on the Vatican Necropolis. Um, hopefully you can hear me and see me um, our first time uh, using this setup, so um, I should be able to see any comments. So um, if the volume is not good or the uh, image is not good, um, please uh, feel free to let me know. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Father Stephen Logue, um, and I am the assistant uh, the parochial vicar here at St. Leo the Great Catholic Church. Um, and uh, for year, for about five years, I lived and studied at the Pontifical North American College, um, which is the um, location in Rome where American seminarians and priests are able to live and study. Um, uh, it's a little confusing uh, in that we live at the college and we study at a university. Uh, so for the first three years, I studied at the Pontifical Gregorian University, uh, with, which boasts such esteemed graduates as St. Maximilian Kolbe, among others. Um, and this university is run by the Jesuits. This is where I got my equivalent of a master's in theology. And then I switched for the last two years to the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, sometimes called the Angelicum, uh, since St. Thomas is known as the Angelic Doctor. And it was uh, here that I studied uh, moral theology with a particular focus in bioethics um, to obtain my licentiate degree. Uh, but all the while we lived at um, the North American College. And this uh, is actually our view uh, from the North American College. Um, I was walking by when one of my classmates was taking this very picture from his room window. Um, he had a better view of St. Peter's than I did. Uh, and so our location was just on the next hill over, the, um, the Janiculum Hill, which is right next to the Vatican Hill. And an important aspect of our time of study and preparation for ordination to the priesthood was the apostolate. Uh, and the apostolate was our opportunity to go out um, and to engage in some form of ministry with the people of God, um, to reach out to them and to uh, engage with them. And I was very blessed with the opportunity to uh, have the Scavi apostolate, um, which is leading the tours beneath St. Peter's Basilica. And so I had that apostolate for the first two years of my time in Rome. Um, but the first year we didn't start right away. We didn't start until... Um, we started studying around halfway through the year. Uh, so for about a year and a half, a little over a year and a half, and on and off, uh, every once in a while after that, um, I led the Scavi tours of um, the excavations, and that is what I'm going to attempt to present to you here tonight. Um, unfortunately, pictures are not allowed in the Scavi, or else I would have gone down there and taken all the best pictures I could. Um, so I had to sort of scrounge the pictures here. They're not um, some of them are not as good as I would like, um, so please uh, forgive me for that. So, first to look at the floor plan of St. Peter's Basilica. Um, this is important to understand what we're talking about. Uh, this is um, the above, the bird's eye view um, of the layout of St. Peter's Basilica. At the bottom of your screen, you can see the um, entryway uh, and then heading up towards the middle towards the top of your screen, um, you see the center point. Um, and so the, the basic shape of this basilica is cruciform, uh, which means it's in the shape of a cross. Uh, so you can see that highlighted there, um, the cross shape um, outlined by the floor plan of this basilica. Uh, in the very center of the cross is the baldacchino. Um, this is the tall structure pictured here uh, that covers and, and um, acts as a sort of structure on top of the main altar of the basilica, um, the altar that is traditionally used by the Pope um, and others only on very rare occasions. Um, this altar here uh, at the far back of the church is the altar of the chair. Uh, it contains um, a basically a giant reliquary um, of the chair of Peter. So it's a, an actual wooden chair that's believed to have belonged to the Apostle Peter. 
Uh, and something that makes a cathedral a cathedral is having the cathedra, the chair of the bishop that presides there. Um, and so this uh, is, a, is meant to connect the basilica um, right back to the days of Peter um, when he was the first bishop of Rome. Now, uh, here's a picture of the altar of the chair. Uh, and above the altar of the chair, you can see the very famous stained glass window um, of the Holy Spirit, uh, that gold uh, and orangish window there with the dove in the center. Right below that in the uh, dark metal uh, structure, that's the, what contains the chair of Peter. Uh, now this picture is uh, very special. It's from one of the ordinations that we do at the altar of the chair. Um, part of the blessing of studying in Rome is uh, some of us are uh, ordained deacons at the altar of the chair. Uh, and so that uh, picture there is from one of the ordinations a few years before my own. Um, and the area that's now highlighted is the area that's used for ordination seating. Uh, during the ordination mass, all of the chairs are placed in that area. And we fit around a thousand people in that area for the ordination. All the while, all the areas in yellow remain open to pilgrims. Um, and the mass of ordination is never remotely disturbed um, by the presence of the pilgrims in the rest of the basilica, um, which just sort of gives you a sense of the scale of this basilica, that we can comfortably have this massive mass um, in the back, essentially behind the main altar. Um, so you can kind of picture your own church and where the, the freestanding altar is between that and, the, and where the tabernacle is in most churches. Um, that's essentially where we fit these thousand people for mass. So, uh, and it's right below here, roughly in the area marked in green, that we have the Roman necropolis. Uh, so here's another picture of St. Peter's. This is looking straight at the Baldacchino and through the Baldacchino to that back wall where the altar of the chair is, where the Holy Spirit window is. And you can actually see the um, writing along the top towards the ceiling, right before the ceiling starts to curve. Um, those letters are about six feet tall, uh, which really gives uh, an even better sense of the scale of this building. So now we back out um, outside of the basilica. This is looking at the front of St. Peter's Basilica. Um, and in particular, looking at the obelisk here. Um, all of the obelisks in Rome were brought by the Romans, uh, stolen from the Egyptians. Uh, the Romans loved them so much, there are more obelisks in the city of Rome than there are in Egypt today. Uh, and the Romans carefully loaded them onto ships and brought them all the way um, to Rome. This one is unique in that it doesn't have any hieroglyphics on it. Most of them are covered in the Egyptian writing, um, but this one is, uh, is blank. This obelisk is around 331 tons, and it stands 134 and a half feet tall. Um, and it, we believe it was carved in Heliopolis in Egypt around 3,200 years ago, uh, and was eventually moved to Rome. Now, this obelisk is not where it was placed by the Romans. Uh, it was moved. Um, and here's a drawing of the effort to move this obelisk to be in the center uh, of St. Peter's Square. Uh, it took around 900 men and 72 horses in the 1500s to move this obelisk without breaking it. Uh, and there were severe penalties on any of the workers who spoke during this uh, project, because the fear was that if someone were to speak and distract someone else, in a moment it could drop, it could crack, uh, and then it would be ruined. Um, but there was one worker who realized that the ropes needed to be kept wet so that they wouldn't snap. Uh, and he spoke up and he was uh, richly rewarded for potentially saving this obelisk. And now this is to the left of St. Peter's Basilica, if you're looking at the front of it. Um, and you can see, hopefully, in the bottom center of the picture, a small group of people gathered there. Um, so to the left is the sacristy, to the right is St. Peter's Basilica, the middle is the bridge that connects them, and where those people are standing, that is where the original, uh, the original obelisk stood. Um, the obelisk that's now in the center of St. Peter's Basilica, it was right there. Um, and actually in the days of the former basilica, um, that 
is where it was located. It wasn't in the center of the square until the current basilica was built. Now here's another um, diagram from above to, to give a sense. So um, you can see in gray, St. Peter's Basilica with um, the famous colonnades um, in the dark blue in the center of the basilica, that is an outline roughly of the Roman necropolis. Uh, and in green down below, that's the sacristy. And so right between the sacristy and St. Peter's Basilica, just to the right, you can see a little black dot in the center of that red line. Um, now the red is the Circus of Nero. Uh, and this circus uh, is not what we think of when we think of a circus. Uh, it was a racetrack. Think of the Circus Maximus. Um, so you can see the racetrack shape uh, where they would have chariot races and other events. Um, and that center line is the midpoint. It was the fence that um, marked the middle of the track around which all the riders had to travel. Um, and the center of that uh, fence was marked with the obelisk that's now in the center of um, St. Peter's Square. Here's a, a depiction of what that circus might have looked like. Um, you can see it uh, has the stands all around it. Um, you can even, I think they have the small chariots depicted there. And in, in the center of that center line, you can see the um, obelisk um, standing, uh, marking the, the midpoint of the track. Now, this site along with almost every other site used for the entertainment of Rome citizens was also used for the brutal killing of Christians, um, often for sport, often to appease the crowds. Um, now the Romans had a number of reasons to dislike the Christians. Most of them were false. Uh, so the first reason that many Romans disliked the Christians was uh, because there was a rumor traveling around that Christians married their brothers and sisters committing incest. Now, as you might remember from coming to Mass, the priest quite often addresses the faithful as brothers and sisters. And this is nothing new. And in the old days, the ancient church, uh, many of the faithful would address any other member of the faithful as brother or sister, recognizing our uh, kinship with Christ. Uh, this confused the Romans and led them to conclude that we were committing incest. The other reason the Romans disliked the Christians was they believed that we ate children. And now this absurd belief um, probably arose from the fact that Christians spoke of eating the body and blood of Jesus at their ceremonies um, at the mass. And the Romans thinking, well, Christ is dead and gone, um, so surely they can't be eating him anymore. They must have run out. So who could they be eating? Mm, children. Um, with those two ridiculous assumptions was a third reason for hating the Christians, and this one we were guilty of, uh, and that was the refusal to worship the Roman gods. Uh, the Romans had uh, a very simple understanding of their relationship with their gods, and that was if the people worship the gods, the gods are happy and the people are blessed. If the people don't worship the gods, the gods are not happy and disasters uh, befall the, the people. And the particular disaster that's relevant to our story today is the Great Fire of Rome. Uh, this is the fire under the reign of Emperor Nero, um, which was quite controversial, uh, mainly because Nero wished to build himself a massive palace where many of Rome's citizens lived. And then suddenly a fire conveniently burned that entire section of the city along with much more. And in the ashes, Nero built his golden palace. This led many of the, of the people of Rome to believe that Nero himself had ordered the fire to be started, which led to the classic image of Nero fiddling while the city burned, um, fiddling with joy that he was going to get his palace. Nero knew this was a problem. He needed a scapegoat to take the blame for the fire. And the most obvious and easy scapegoat were the Christians. Um, the Christians hadn't worshipped the gods, the gods were angry, and therefore punished the city with a fire. And this is a, a classic painting here um, of 
some of the many ways that the Christians were killed for the entertainment of the Romans, uh, for the entertainment of Nero, um, and uh, to appease the bloodlust of many of Rome's citizens. And now this gets us to the Apostle Peter, because it was during the persecution of Nero um, after the Great Fire that Peter himself, along with Paul, uh, were arrested and um, put to death. Uh, there's a, a beautiful tradition that accompanies the martyrdom of St. Peter, uh, and that is that he was fleeing the city, knowing the persecutions were imminent. And um, as he left the city on one of the main roads, uh, he had a vision of the crucified Christ, or Christ on the way to his crucifixion, complete with crown of thorns and the wounds and carrying his cross, um, heading towards the city of Rome. And Peter, seeing this, he said, Domine quo vadis, uh, which is Latin for, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, I am going to Rome to be crucified again in your place. And with that wake-up call, Peter himself turned around and went back into the city of Rome um, to stand with uh, the faithful who were being persecuted and rounded up. He himself was arrested um, and sentenced to death. Uh, now, as a citizen of the Roman Empire, St. Paul was to be put to death by a beheading. Um, but as a non-citizen, Peter was subject to crucifixion. Peter was taken to the Circus of Nero, uh, which we were just discussing, on the Vatican Hill. And he was um, to be crucified there for the... Uh, appeasing of the crowds, and he asked his executioners, uh, he said, I'm not worthy to die the way my Lord died, um, and so he asked that he be crucified upside down, um, and they, of course, had no problem uh, accommodating this request. And now one of the reasons the Circus of Nero was used uh, was because the Vatican Hill largely wasn't. Uh, this was the outskirts of the city, it was the far side of the Tiber River, um, other than a road leading out of the city, a small necropolis, and the circus, there was nothing here. Uh, it was not very good land for constructing things. So in the wake of the fire, Nero used this land as a sort of refugee camp. So it was very convenient for the displaced citizens and the most uh, upset citizens to go straight into the circus and be calmed down and appeased by the murdering of uh, many Christians. So um, the question is then what became of Peter's body? Now the Romans viewing him as a criminal uh, would have happily just thrown his body into the river. Uh, but the Christians from the earliest days had a great uh, respect and veneration for the bodies of uh, the saints, particularly the bodies of martyrs. Um, and especially of someone as important as Peter. And now the early Christians were smart. They knew that the Romans respected the dead. Uh, they largely didn't want to disturb the resting places of the deceased. And so they knew that if they could get Peter into the ground, they had a pretty good chance of keeping him safe. Uh, there was always the possibility the Romans would break their, um, or go against their tendencies there. Um, but they, they definitely wanted to get Peter into the ground quickly. And the lo most logical place to do this was right alongside the Circus of Nero. Uh, there was the road, as I mentioned, that leads in and out of the city of Rome. And it was along this road, as well as many of the other roads, that the Roman necropolis would um, spring up. The Roman necropolis being the traditional way that Romans buried their dead. Uh, they built small houses for them. Um, and we'll see many examples of this in a few minutes. Um, and the Christians wanted to get Peter into this necropolis to be almost lost among the other bodies um, and the other tombs. And the really the only thing they would have had at their disposal, the only method of burying him, would have been to use the uh, poor man's grave. Um, so they couldn't build a massive monument, a big house um, for him, but uh, simply dig a poor man's grave, which was... Um, digging a hole, a grave, much like we would understand it today, putting his body in that grave and covering it with two slabs of marble um, that lean up against each other, almost like a small tent, and then burying that. Um, so this image is a model of what that burial site eventually looked like. Um, and in the picture towards the bottom, you can see that little tent-like structure. 
um, represented in the model of where the poor man's grave was. And now the, the structure that you see above this is called the monument or the trophy of Gaius. Uh, and so Peter was killed uh, around the year, uh, around the late 60s. Um, and the monument that you see here, this red wall with the white um, platform and columns supporting it, um, that was constructed um, around the year 150. Uh, and now this is unique because it was constructed to look very innocuous, to look like a pagan monument. There were no overt Christian symbols here. Um, nothing that would uh, attract the attention of the Romans. However, it was constructed very intentionally. Uh, there was an area around this monument that would be very easy to fill with water for baptisms. Uh, in addition, when standing at this monument, that platform, although it looks like a, a almost front porch, um, that platform uh, was around waist high. And so it would have been a perfect platform on which to celebrate the mass. Uh, this monument was also positioned so that uh, standing at the monument, you could see an approaching person on the path, on the road, before they could see you, and you could clear out um, before any trouble um, approached. So um, there are unique things about this monument of Gaius. Uh, and now it earned the title monument of Gaius because in around the year 200, uh, there were letters back and forth between two Christians, one in Rome named Gaius and one in Jerusalem. And they were arguing which city was more important for Christianity. And the man in Jerusalem said, oh, clearly we're the more important. We have um, all these places where Jesus himself walked. And this is, this is where he lived. This is where he died. Um, we're the more important. And Gaius countered. He said, well, many of these, uh, uh, sure, you had these things of Jesus there. But the apostles then dispersed. They went to the four corners of the world. And then he said this, and quote, I, it, he, excuse me, first he said, if you come to Rome uh, and see, he said, you, I, he said, quote, I can show you the trophies of the apostles. If, in fact, you go out towards the Vatican or along via Ostia, you will find the trophies of those who founded this church. And now from the very beginning, the understanding has been that it was both Peter and Paul that founded the church in Rome, which was unique because all of the other ancient churches uh, recognize one apostle as their founder. Uh, no city was blessed with that um, unique opportunity to have two apostles that they view as their founding apostles. Uh, and so uh, Gaius clearly mentions the Vatican, which again had nothing on it but the circus and the mausoleums. And when he speaks of trophies, what he's speaking of are the tombs uh, and the re final resting place. That's the understanding of trophy. So with the trophy constructed around 150, uh, Gaius referencing it specifically referring to Peter around the year 200, we fast forward again to a little after the year 300. Uh, and this is when the emperor died and his son, Constantine, uh, felt that he deserved to be the next emperor. Uh, now, Constantine faced a little bit of a problem. This is a uh, great statue of uh, Emperor Constantine, uh, which is actually in York, England. And now it's in York, England, because uh, he was there. That's where he was when his father died. Uh, he was there with some of the Roman army, which is an awful long way from Rome. Now, his uh, rival and opponent, a man named Maxentius, uh, took the opportunity to gain the loyalty of the remaining Roman armies in Italy and seized the city of Rome, proclaiming himself the emperor. Constantine wasn't about to back down from a fight, so he took his army, which was with him in England, and began the march back to Rome. Realizing that Maxentius controlled not only about four times his forces, but also all of the defenses of the city of Rome, Constantine knew that he needed some divine help. And so before the battle, he prayed. Uh, and he prayed to any god that was up there, uh, any of the Roman gods or any god, he wasn't picky, that wanted to help him. He said, if you help me, I will build you temples. I will offer sacrifices. Um, I'll be eternally in your debt. Um, please, please, please make me the emperor. And according to tradition, he saw a sign in the sky. 
Some say it was a cross, um, but the more believable uh, account, I think, is that it was this symbol that you see on your screen now, um, the symbol of the Chi Rho. Um, now, these are two Greek letters. What looks like an S to uh, or an X to us is the Greek letter Chi or Chi. Uh, what looks like a P to us is the Greek letter Rho. And he sees this sign, which means nothing to him, and he hears the words in hoc signo vinces, which is Latin for in this sign you will conquer. And he says, okay, that's good enough for me. So he has that sign painted on the shields and or the breastplates of his troops, and they march towards Rome. Maxentius stupidly and very confusingly leaves the defenses of the city with his army to meet Constantine in open battle. And they meet on the Milvian Bridge. And now this was incredibly advantageous to Constantine because it almost completely negated the advantage of Maxentius's greater numbers. However, he still had a very steep uphill climb. And surprisingly, against all the odds, um, even with Maxentius's stupid moves, Constantine defeated him and uh, was able to claim the throne of Roman emperor for himself. And now, with that uh, great victory, he uh, asked, hey, who, who gave me this victory? Which god should I be thankful to? Um, this, this god of this symbol that I, I don't understand. Uh, and somebody informed him that that symbol, those two letters, the chi and the rho, are the first two Greek letters of the Greek word Christos, which is Greek for Christ. Uh, so this was a Christian symbol. Constantine realized that they probably shouldn't be killing the Christians if their god has this kind of clout. And so he, in 313, uh, proclaimed the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire. And he approached these Christians and said, what would you like me to build you? He said, you don't have temples because you've been hiding uh, underground for all these years. Um, but I want to build you something in thanks. What can I build you? And they said, we don't know. We've never had a building before. Um, and he said, well, how about a basilica, which was a Roman uh, meeting place? Um, and they said, okay, that sounds good. So uh, here's a, a depiction of what a Roman style basilica would often look like. Um, and of course, the Christians took it and uh, made it our own. Um, and so the first basilica that he built was St. John Lateran, which is. Uh, across the city in Rome. But the Christians kept going to the Vatican Hill to worship. And he said, hey, what gives? I build you this big brand new basilica, um, but you're still going to this old graveyard um, to worship. And the Christians, a little nervous, probably, um, still not sure if this was a, a trap, um, said, well, we want to worship here because this is where Peter is buried. And Constantine said, okay. Uh, well, I guess I'll build you another basilica. Um, and so he undertook the massive project of constructing a basilica uh, on the Vatican Hill. And now this was a, a monumental endeavor for a number of reasons. First and foremost, it is terrible ground. It is kind of boggy and, and almost a little swampy. Um, it was infested with snakes. Um, and it was a not insignificant hill uh, on which you're trying to build something level. And now beyond that, there was the dilemma of the Roman necropolis. Uh, against it, it was against Roman law to disturb the dead. And Constantine knew that he couldn't easily um, oust um, these Roman uh, citizens, um, but uh, by imperial decree, he was able to uh, um, force them <laughs> to either move or be okay with your uh, family tomb being buried underneath this Christian basilica. So he gave the Romans a, a certain amount of time to remove their loved ones and bury them elsewhere. Um, but after that time, he was going to completely um, fill in that necropolis. So um, what Constantine had to do um, to address this steep slope uh, was to build a massive, a series of massive retaining walls, and then to fill in the inside with dirt to make it level. And in this process, he buried almost completely, um, uh, pretty much completely, the Roman necropolis. And on top of that, built the first St. Peter's Basilica in the early to mid 300s. Now, 
put that part of the story on hold and we fast forward to uh, the 20th century. Um, Pope Pius XI dies in 1939, um, and his request was to be buried in the basement level of St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, and now this is the basement, but it's still above the Roman necropolis, uh, which had been buried for the entirety of that time. Um, his successor, Pope Pius XII, um, agrees to uh, this rec last request to be buried there. Um, but Pius XII knows that this um, basement level is not very nice. It's sort of unfinished. Um, it had a very low ceiling. Um, and he thought this would be a nice project to clean it up um, and to make it a place where we can bury future popes or, or other important figures um, and just make it a nicer place in general. So uh, they undertook the task knowing that they couldn't raise the ceiling since the massive St. Peter's Basilica sits on top of them. Um, they took the opportunity to instead lower the floor. And it was during this lowering of the floor um, that they made an incredible discovery. Uh, now here's a, a view of that basement level, another view of it, um, with a chapel in the center. Um, and so as they dug out this uh, basement level and, and dug down into the floor, um, it's actually just a little to the right off of your view there, um, they suddenly found ancient bricks, uh, very ancient bricks. And they took these to the Pope and they said, we need to, to investigate this. They said, there have been rumors of a Roman necropolis buried beneath St. Peter's and the final resting place of the Apostle Peter. Um, can we excavate and see what we can find? And uh, Pius XII said, okay. He agreed on a few conditions. He said, first and foremost, um, you can't use any power tools. He said, if this is a, a necropolis, there are human remains and we need to treat them with respect and the dignity that they deserve and not risk damaging them with, with power tools. I said, okay. Um, and he said, second, you need to only work at night so as not to disturb the pilgrims who come here during the day. Even uh, without power tools, there'd still be plenty of commotion. And he said, third, related to those first two, um, you need to work in complete and total secrecy. No one can know what you're doing. Uh, the workers can't tell anyone. Um, there can't be any record of it um, or, or no public record, no, no advertising your findings, no publishing your findings until I say. And this sounds a little restrictive, but we have to remember this excavation began in the late 30s, early 40s, uh, when the Nazis were on the rise to power, especially in Germany and Italy. Uh, and just like the movies Indiana Jones would lead you to believe, the Nazis had a strange fascination with all things ancient, all things that could give them a sort of legitimacy um, from ancient empires. And so anything uh, that monumental of a discovery uh, would have certainly attracted their attention and risked them invading St. Peter's and possibly bulldozing the floor of St. Peter's itself um, to get at this Roman necropolis. Um, so Pius XII kept it very wisely um, silent. Now we put a couple people in charge of this project. Um, on the right you see Monsignor Ludwig Koss, um, who worked in the Vatican and was placed in charge of the overall project. Uh, and on the left you see uh, Father Kirschbaum. Uh, Father Kirschbaum was an aspiring archaeologist uh, and very eager to find the tomb of Peter. Uh, and unfortunately these two men clashed. Um, Monsignor Koss was not keen on the excavations, um, and he didn't think they were being very respectful. Um, Father Kirschbaum was very eager, uh, thought Monsignor Koss was holding back and holding him back. Um, and as a result, they never really communicated well or at all. Um, in fact, Monsignor Koss would really only visit the site um, when the workers were not working um, and observe the progress. So very unfortunate. Um, I think it's certainly due to uh, failings on the part of both men. Neither is really the villain here and neither the hero. Um, both could have done better to um, work together um, to avoid the complications that we'll get to in a minute. So here's a side view of St. Peter's Basilica. Um, the black lines represent the main basilica itself. You see on the left, the Baldacchino, um, a, just a little to the right of the center of the picture um, where there's a number four. Um, you can see a little statue. That's the St. Peter statue where everybody rubs his foot. Um, and the foot is all shiny and almost uh, rubbed smooth of details. Um, beneath it, you see the, the pink or reddish level 
That's the basement level that we were just looking at. And beneath that in blue is the Roman necropolis itself um, that was excavated. So looking at it from the, the top, this is the um, view of what was excavated. This is the, the outline. Um, you can see the different color codings there that everything dark blue was pre-Constantine. Um, everything red were part of the retaining walls built by Constantine. Um, and then a few structures were added later when the current basilica was uh, built. And that is the basic direction that we're going to be moving. We're going to start towards that end um, and move uh, the other way, which is the basic way that the archaeologists move. So first, uh, the Egyptian tomb, which is labeled Z on that uh, map. Um, the Egyptian tomb is called that because it's full of Egyptian symbolism. Um, one of the images here you can see on the left, um, and it is the uh, Egyptian deity um, holding uh, the Ankh, that uh, A-N-K-H, that uh, common Egyptian symbol, the loop um, with the crossbar. Um, and it is the, an image of the Egyptian god Ra. Uh, now, the Romans didn't really know what they believed about death. Um, it was kind of whatever you wanted to pick and choose from the different um, theologies and, and uh, pantheons of the people that they had conquered. And now here's a view of some of the sarcophagi in the tomb. The main uh, featured sarcophagus here is covered in a scene of a uh, party hosted by the god Bacchus. Um, so towards the right of the sarcophagus, you can see a woman uh, laying there dying, presumably the person buried here. Uh, and towards the left is uh, Bacchus riding in on a chariot um, to whisk her away to an eternity of partying in the afterlife, uh, which is what some Romans believed. Uh, now, the other sarcophagi here that you can see partly in the picture represent the other end of the Roman belief, the more uh, Greek uh, platonic view. Um, and the curved uh, design on them is, comes from the Roman, uh, the, the tool, a strigil. And now the Romans used a strigil to bathe themselves. They would um, scrape away grime and, um, and dirt um, and, and what they were bathing themselves in. Um, and so the strigil came to represent death to many Romans um, because they saw death as a shedding of the physical, um, that they were going to be freed from the physical and, and something immaterial, spiritual would remain in some form. They didn't really know what. Um, now, here's the, the marking at uh, A, which is the end of the line. Um, it is the far right on that map that I showed you a minute ago. Um, and the, there's really no reason to show you A because it is uh, a wall of dirt. Um, that's where the archaeologists stopped excavating. Um, when they first began excavating, they'll, they excavated a tomb that we'll see in just a moment. Um, and then they moved down to the right on that map. They got to tomb A and they stopped, um, both because they were worried about the structural integrity of St. Peter's Basilica, um, but also because they wanted to go in the other direction where um, they believed the tomb of Peter to be located. So here's a, a bird's eye view. And although tomb A is still well within the, the boundaries of St. Peter's Basilica itself, um, the, Ro the, the archaeologists have every reason to believe that the Roman necropolis and the ancient road go all the way through the square, down the street, and to the river, uh, which is an incredible um, amount of things left unexcavated. Um, and now this is around the position of tomb A, which you can see on part of the map there. And it's looking this direction. Um, this is the remains of the Roman road. Uh, now the sarcophagus you can see there would not have been in the middle of the road. It's there for uh, display purposes for the tour. Um, but this was part of the road leading out of the city. And uh, it very much lived up to its name, a necropolis, necropolis, um, a city of the dead. And it really was that. It was small homes. Um, that were meant to be places to live for the deceased members of the family. So um, the first main tomb, the first tomb that they excavated is the Catani family tomb. Uh, and you can see it there in the picture. Um, this is the tomb that they came right down into. Um, and this tomb is unique for a couple of reasons. Um, mainly the... Uh, 
that there are stairs and a second floor. Um, so one of the Roman traditions was coming and partying um, where uh, the family necropolis was. Uh, and the Romans would often gather a large party. Um, and clearly the Catani had a big family or a lot of friends because one floor wasn't enough. Um, so they added a set of stairs and a second floor. Um, and we can tell this was added because the door itself to the necropolis was moved. Um, away from the main intricately carved lintel above it um, to make room for the staircase. And it was the Catani's appetite for parties that made sure their tomb was tall enough that it was the first ones that the workers found when they were just trying to lower the floor. So uh, another element of the Catani family tomb that's present in many of the other tombs are the libation holes. And now in a Roman necropolis, there were a variety of ways that a Roman would be buried. They could either be cremated and put in an urn on a, a small niche, or they could be buried in a sarcophagus and placed on display, uh, the sarcophagus itself. Um, or they could be buried beneath the floor in tombs down there. And if they were buried be beneath the floor, the Romans would include these small holes that led down to the tomb, um, and they were called libation holes. Because when you were at the party having a, a celebration, um, you would take a little wine, maybe a little food, and pour it down the hole, um, offering a libation to the deceased um, because who knows what the afterlife is like. Maybe they would benefit from it. Um, that was the, the Roman understanding. Moving down the line is the Valeri family tomb. Now this is the biggest and clearly the wealthiest family tomb that was excavated. Um, you can see a bit of the opulence here in this picture. You can also see that there's a section of red um, stone, um, a little below waist height, traveling the total diameter, the total uh, um, exterior, or the total interior of this tomb. Um, and when they first excavated it, they discovered some writing on uh, this section of red, writing done in charcoal. Um, and it was very faint and very hard to read, and it has since faded completely because it was only in charcoal and it was only the dirt that was preserving it. Um, but they fortunately brought in an expert, um, Dr. Margarita Guarducci, uh, who was a language expert who had been working in Crete and around the world studying ancient languages and ancient writings. Um, and she was brought in to um, figure out this writing uh, and then kept on the project to uh, decipher and, and catalog any writing that was discovered. Um, but she, in her meticulous work, was unable to keep up with the breakneck speed of the uh, archaeology team. And so she fell behind um, upwards of a couple of decades by the end of it. Um, but first she was brought in to look at this writing in charcoal in the Valeri family tomb. And after some study, she concluded it said, basically, Peter, pray for the Christian men and women buried near your body. Now, this is very strange. Um, first of all, this is the first evidence that Peter is here um, that the, or nearby that the uh, uh, archaeologists had found. Um, secondly, how was this done in the tomb of a wealthy pagan Roman family? How was this graffiti allowed in a society that so revered the dead? We'll get more on that mystery in a moment. Another sign of the Valeri family wealth, um, this is the exterior of their, um, their mausoleum. Um, and it is constructed with bricks. And as you can see, it's using a teeny tiny amount of mortar, almost no mortar whatsoever between these bricks. Uh, and this was a very clear status symbol of the Valeri. Uh, all of the Roman um, sarcophag, all, uh, all of the Roman brick manufactories were owned by the emperor himself. And so brick was very, very expensive. Uh, so it was a very clear status symbol, a sign of wealth um, to use almost no mortar um, to prove that you could buy just that much more brick. Uh, you could afford it instead of buying less brick and using more mortar um, to make it cheaper. Uh, here's another view of that area, um, a little section of the map here. Um, the sideways H there um, is what you can see as the main Valeri family tomb. This is outside the Valeri family tomb. Um, it's not the best picture of it, but it has our Holy Father in it, um, looking down because that railing protects a hole almost in the middle of the road um, that was dug presumably by the Valeri family, so that when their raucous parties needed a refreshing drink of water, 
They didn't need to go all the way down to the river or to a well somewhere. They had a cistern right there, um, right outside their tomb. Um, and the servants could lower water, lower buckets in and, and bring up water from it. And now this view is, uh, again, on the map, it's over at that sort of H uh, prime. And uh, this is outside the Valeri family tomb. Uh, and it is a series of uh, little cubbies on the wall. Um, this was for their servants. Um, in the afterlife, the servants got to remain by their master's sides. The servants were cremated and uh, placed um, their remains in these little um, cubbies uh, so that they could be near the Valeri family forever. And now the excavators also noticed some more clues um, that are today placed around this area. That on many of the sarcophagi, it was common for the Romans to carve a likeness of the person buried there. Um, and you can see those uh, pointed out here. Uh, however, on most of the, or a lot of the sarcophagi that they found, um, despite the rest of them being in near perfect condition, the face of the deceased who was presumed buried there uh, was scratched off, literally defaced. Um, and they began to realize that this was a sign of what was happening. Um, and now one more, one more clue um, as to what was happening. Uh, here's a, a um, basically headstone um, that they would mount on the wall. Uh, and now if you took this headstone off the wall and it's right today mounted right where you can see on the map, uh, took this off the wall and turned it around, it would have that nice, precise, um, professionally done Roman script talking about a good pagan Roman family. But someone peeled this off the wall, flipped it over, carved their own message, and put it back up in a society that so valued the resting places of the dead. And the carving that they made here says, Flavius Olympius, who lived 35 years and 10 months and 17 days, he was a good brother to all and never quarreled with anyone. And now there's something important on this headstone, and it's in the top right corner. It is the Chi Rho, that Christian symbol present again, blatantly present uh, on this headstone. And what the excavators and the researchers realized had happened was that during the time Constantine um, had his grace period to remove any pagans buried there to make way for the construction of the basilica, as the Roman citizens moved the pagan relatives out, Christians came in and put their relatives in their place, often occupying the same sarcophagi, defacing them to show this is no longer the person buried here, pulling down their headstones and carving their own messages into the back of them, and leaving graffiti uh, in these soon-to-be-buried tombs, imploring the help of the saints, particularly Peter. So all of this got the um, archaeologists very excited, um, and they were even more excited when they found our next tomb. Um, this is uh, the tomb marked as M. It is very tiny. Um, on the tour, you can only go in one at a time to see this tomb, and it is filled with some of the most beautiful mosaics on the uh, that, that were discovered here. Um, and they have some very interesting symbols. Uh, in the top right, you can see a man fishing, one fish biting the hook and the other swimming away. Um, and in the bottom, uh, you can see a man being eaten by a fish, thrown out of a boat and being eaten by a fish. Um, and now these symbols seemed fairly innocuous to a pagan Roman viewer, um, but to a Christian, they would have stood out glaringly. Uh, the top symbol, uh, the top right symbol of the fishing, of course, Jesus called his apostles to be fishers of men. Uh, and we know that some accept that gospel and uh, come towards the fishermen and some reject it and swim away. Uh, the bottom right is a little more nuanced. Of course, it, it, to any Christian or, or good uh, Jew, it would represent the story of, of Jonah um, being eaten by the whale. Uh, but to the early Christians, it had an added significance. And that was that as Jonah had spent three days and nights in the belly of the whale, so Jesus spent three days and nights in the belly of the earth and, remove, and, and uh, emerged victorious. Um, and it harkens back to what Christ said, that uh, the, the, many of this generation ask for a sign, but no sign will be given them except the sign of Jonah, uh, referring to that prefigurement of his own death and resurrection. 
Now, the top left is even more interesting because this is clearly, to any Roman citizen, the Greek or the, the, the god Apollo, um, the god of the sun, riding his chariot across the sky, the rays of the sun emerging from behind him to um, as he drags the sun from one side of the sky to the other. So this would have clearly been Apollo to any uh, casual Roman citizen. Now, if the Romans had looked a little closer, they would have realized that something was off with this depiction of Apollo. Uh, first of all, he's holding a globe. You can see it there in his hand. Uh, it's a small bluish greenish globe. Now, contrary to popular belief these days, we've known the earth is round since the ancient Greeks and the Romans were no exception. Um, so the globe like that and, and a figure holding it represents that person having dominion over the earth. And now this was bad pagan theology because Apollo is the god of the sun. He has no particular dominion over the earth. Um, so why is he depicted holding the earth? The other thing that um, is odd about this is that instead of having more even rays coming from behind his head, uh, there seems to be a, a bit of a preference for a vertical ray and horizontal rays, um, showing a, a sort of hidden cross. Uh, because in fact, this isn't Apollo, it's Christ disguised as Apollo. Christ who is the sun, um, Christ who is the light of the world with the cross behind his head, who does indeed have dominion over the earth. Um, so this tomb, unlike the other signs that we just saw, this was constructed by a wealthy Christian family that were able to hide their Christianity in plain sight before Constantine opened up and many other Christians flooded this area. Um, so this is a very um, exciting uh, find for them, although um, not particularly pointing towards the presence of Peter. Now, in the next area, um, there's a diverging um, path to the right and down, um, because as they got to this point, they knew that they were very close to um, what where they believed the monument of Gaius and the poor man's grave beneath it were. And Constantine, when he built the first basilica, had encased that monument in marble, um, totally surrounded it in marble. And the, the archeologists didn't really wanna break through that marble um, that was placed there by Emperor Constantine. They wanted to, to get at it another way. So they dug down instead and came, tried to come up underneath the poor man's grave. And now at this point, they did in fact find, as described, right beneath this um, marble encased structure, um, two slabs of marble on top of, leaning on each other, a poor man's grave filled with human bones. Um, at this point, they stopped. They brought uh, the Pope himself down to this spot in the tomb, uh, in, the, in the necropolis, and they handed out the bones to the Pope, who then placed them in a box reverently. They took that box to the Pope's personal physician, um, who was not an archeologist, but could do a, a quick check. And he was able to determine that yes, it was bones from a human um, and they appeared sufficiently old, um, which was very exciting um, for the archeologists. However, once those bones were actually examined, it was discovered that they were bones from at least three people. Uh, and probably two of them were women. One of them was a man, but that man was no more than 30 or 40 years old. And for Peter to be the person who was at the side of Jesus, uh, he would have had to have been at least 60 years old. So really none of these three could have been Peter. Uh, and with great disappointment, they continued on their search. Um, and the Pope at around that time announced that they'd found the tomb of the apostle Peter, making no mention of um, his bones. Uh, now, uh, here you can see the first look at the red wall that they were able to uh, obtain, the, that monument of Gaius, which is sometimes called the red wall. Um, and it's really difficult to see. Um, this is the best picture of it I could find. Um, and around the middle of the picture below that top uh, question mark, it's from the virtual tour on the Vatican website, um, you can see um, very uh, filled with light um, that little column. That's one of the two columns that supported that table on front in the front of the red wall. Um, and this was the first place they were sort of able to get at that structure within Constantine's marble. Uh, here's a closer picture of it. Um, 
uh, partly excavated that, that small column. It's really not as big as it might look on the models. Um, and this is part of that red wall that they found. Now, um, we're going to pause this. Hopefully, this video is working for you. Um, here's a, a sort of 3D model of what the red wall looked like. Um, again, you can see it a lot like the model in the uh, beginning of the presentation. Um, but when they, and, and a lot as they expected it, um, but when they um, excavated it, they found something interesting that a second wall had been built, um, a sort of wall that almost uh, perpendicular to this wall. Um, and it was be it's believed that this wall was constructed to support the red wall, to prevent it from falling down. Um, after some years, it might have been a little unstable. Um, and this wall was called the graffiti wall um, because it was covered in graffiti. Uh, and so the archaeologists did a first sort of look at this. Um, and they determined that none of the graffiti really mentioned Peter. Uh, they saw mentions of uh, references to Jesus, to Mary, to, the, um, to God, but nothing really about Peter, which really um, disappointed them because they expected to find more of Peter. So that view there is about the view that we had a moment ago looking at that one column that's exposed. Um, that's that angle. Um, but around the other side of this graffiti wall, they found something interesting. Um, they found a small hole. Um, now, this hole was in the graffiti wall itself, um, but the inside of this hole, one of the inside walls of the hole was the red wall. It was right up against the red wall. Um, and so you could sort of look in and see part of the red wall itself. But when they looked in this, in this um, hole, they found nothing. Um, and they were very disappointed. Um, and at this point, about. They concluded their excavations, uh, and the, the final result, sort of, was that they hadn't found the tomb of Peter, and they were very disappointed in this. Um, now, fortunately for all of us, um, doc, Dr. Margarita Guarducci, um, who is truly the hero of this story, uh, was not finished with her work, um, because as she went uh, along translating what was found, she finally caught up to this point and was able to look at the writings on the graffiti wall. Now, the archaeologists, as I mentioned, had not found anything particularly um, specific to Peter, um, particularly uh, referencing him. And that was disappointing to them. But Dr. Margarita Guarducci, being the expert, um, noticed something that they had missed. Um, when she looked at these uh, carvings on there, she again saw that he row. Um, the Christian symbol for um, the two Greek letters representing the first two letters of Jesus, of, of Christ, um, referring to Jesus. But she noticed that on many of them, there were three more lines near the bottom of the row. And she said, you know, this is interesting because just like that he row looks like the first two Greek letters of the word Christos, these the little lines make it look like a P and an E the first two Latin letters of the name Petrus, or Peter. She also realized that this um, little addition of these three lines makes it look an awful lot like a key, a very common symbol for Peter. And so she very excitedly looked in this hole, and she discovered that a part of that red wall, um, the inside of the hole, had fallen off since the excavators first looked at it. Um, and she pulled this piece out and she found writing on it. So there's a picture of the piece of the red wall. Um, and the writing that she was sort of able to decipher says, Petros eni in Greek, which means Peter is here or Peter is within. And now this was very exciting. Uh, and Dr. Guarducci was uh, coming to the conclusion that this is the center point of the excavations. Um, and so she went to the records um, to see what was found in this hole. And she found to her disappointment that there was nothing found in that hole. Now, here's where uh, we have to go back to those first two priests um, who were at odds with each other. Um, because Monsignor Koss felt that the archeologists were being very disrespectful of the tombs, of the human remains that were found there, um, they were not really taking the time to care for them properly. Um, he would go down in the off hours 
and any human remains that he found, he would carefully catalog where he found them, he and his assistant, they would box them up um, and they would remove them to be reburied respectfully elsewhere. This was without the knowledge of the archeology span team. And it was in one of those trips that they found this small hole uh, recently uncovered um, and they found human remains in it. So Monsignor Koss and his assistant removed those remains, put them in a box and took them away to be respectfully reburied later. In a chance meeting then, all these years later, Monsignor Koss had passed away and uh, Dr. Guarducci was in the, one of the bars in the Vatican, now not an American bar, uh, an Italian coffee bar. And she ran into Monsignor Casa's old assistant, who was still working there. And she expressed her lament over the fact that nothing was found in this hole. Uh, and the assistant said, well, yeah, there was something found in that hole. We found human remains in that hole. And fortunately, because uh, everything in the Vatican moves a lot slower than you might imagine, those human remains that had been removed by Monsignor Cost to be respectfully reburied later had not yet been reburied and they were still waiting that. So the assistant was able to find the box carefully cataloged as the remains found in that hole and Dr. Guarducci and the experts were able to examine it. And now the first thing they noticed was that there were small fibers uh, located in amongst the bones. Um, fibers dyed with a rare purple dye, a dye that was made from snails found in Anatolia, um, a dye that was illegal for anyone else to own without permission of the emperor, only to be used at the discretion of the emperor. It was so rare. Uh, any fabric dyed with this dye, any, um, any of the dye itself. They also found bones or bone fragments from every bone in the human body except the feet. And all of the bones except the feet were represented, or, or just about all of the bones except the feet were represented um, in the bones that were found um, in that hole. And now, here's the, the evidence um, that this is Peter, because this is what was concluded. Uh, now, first of all, there were the Petrine symbols around where um, the, that specific hole. In addition, the fabric. Um, it's believed that that fabric was either given by the emperor himself, Emperor Constantine himself, with permission, or it was secured by um, Christians at great personal risk, um, that the possession of which could result in, in death. Um, for some reason, they went to all these lengths to get this purple cloth, which was one of the greatest honors, um, a sign of one of the greatest honors that was reserved for the emperor. And now also um, the dirt that they found here was important because there was dirt in these bones that perfectly chemically matched both the dirt in the hole where the bones were found and the dirt in the poor man's grave. So it's believed that the, it's known that the bones spent time in both locations. And it's believed that the early Christians, fearing the Romans would still discover Peter, Peter's tomb and steal his remains, actually dug it up, took out his remains, put other remains in its place to confuse any future grave robbers, and put those bones in this hidden compartment in the graffiti wall. Now, they also were able to test and found that these bones belonged to a man who was at least 60 years old, um, a man probably from the region of Galilee, a man who was short and stocky. And they also realized that the fact that they had bones or fragments from all of almost all human bones above the feet was important. Because if you remember, Peter was crucified upside down. And in order to secure him on the cross upside down, they would have had to use many nails to hold his feet. And the Christians sealing his body in the dead of night out of fear that the Romans would catch them and kill them too, probably didn't have time to remove all those nails. And so they probably cut Peter off at the ankles uh, and took as much of his body as they could to be buried um, in that poor man's grave. And now here's a picture of the hole today. Um, you can see um, past the brick wall on the left, past the uh, much older wall around the center, um, just to the left of that, that wall is and in the most lit up section is a small hole with small boxes in it. Um, here's a, a closer view of the graffiti wall of that hole um, and 
uh, on the right, it actually has the boxes because the bones were placed in um, small clear boxes um, and placed back in um, that hole, back in the, the hole in the graffiti wall. And when they were placed there, they very intentionally placed the jaw bone uh, in the front where it's most visible because it's that jaw that first proclaimed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And now right outside of this bone room, the, the entrance to which is actually up and to the left is the Clementine Chapel. And this chapel has been here uh, for centuries. Um, and in the, the front of this chapel, you can see that probably uh, very faintly, um, that metal grate right above the green altar, um, a metal grate, a gold metal grate, and beyond that, white marble and red marble, or uh, I, I believe it's red porphyry, um, uh, an equally valuable stone. And this chapel, unlike many churches that are cruciform in the shape of a cross, is in the shape of an upside down cross with the altar at the feet instead of the head, um, a very clear symbol of Peter. Um, and I think uh, this chapel raises the question of why it took so long to discover this. Um, because that red stone and white marble beside it, beyond the grate, is part of the marble encasement of Constantine. And right on the other side of that were the remains of Peter. And I think um, the common excuse or the common beliefs as to why no one before the era of World War II actually looked to see what was here, um, People either tend to say, oh, well, um, they were afraid that it might not be true, that there might not be any human remains there, um, and they might be disappointed. Um, and others say, oh, well, their faith was so confident that they saw no reason to check. Um, but I think what's much more believable is that up until very recently, as a society, we didn't have this urge to discover and scientifically prove things because we didn't have the ability to scientifically prove things. Um, the, if they had gone in, they probably would have been fooled by that early swap, uh, looking at the bones in the poor man's grave and saying, well, I guess these are the bones of Peter. Uh, but there was no real testing that could be done or, or not, no real knowledge to be gained until we had more modern um, science. And so then it made sense to actually um, look and see what we could, um, we could discover. And I think, um, it's very important uh, at this point um, to include a bit of scripture and the importance of this scripture. So um, this is from the gospel according to St. Matthew. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, for Catholics, this is the holiest spot outside of the Holy Land, um, because it's here that we have the resting place of that rock on which our church was built. Um, the rock, uh, the spiritual rock, uh, that today rests with the person of Pope Francis, who lives a few hundred meters away from this spot. Um, but in a very real uh, and symbolic way, um, this rock of Peter's bones uh, is the rock on which St. Peter's Basilica is built. Um, because on top of uh, the bones in the graffiti wall next to the red wall um, that supports Constantine's marble structure, that supports various altars throughout the, the, the intervening ages, um, that supports um, the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica itself. If you took a line, uh, a rope, and hung it down from the center of Michelangelo's dome in St. Peter's, it would go straight through the Baldacchino, straight through the center altar, um, straight through all those ancient altars to Constantine's marble, the red wall, the graffiti wall, and that hole. Uh, and so in that real way, it's that, that physical rock and um, the spiritual rock uh, on which this church is built. Um, so 
that um, pretty much concludes um, our tour, uh, our virtual tour of, of, uh, of St. Peter. So if you have any questions, um, as it says in the description, feel free to type them into the, um, uh, the YouTube comments. Um, it should, uh, I should be able to see them and I'll double check. Um, if you're unable to submit them there, um, I'll um, be checking my email. So if you want to send me a quick email, we can try and do it that way. Um, but uh, a final note, and I'm going to try and post it here. Um, there should be in the chat popping up, and I'll put it in the description later, um, a link to the website where you can reserve a tour yourself. So if you go to Rome, um, I strongly recommend that you take the opportunity to go on this tour um, to see these things yourself. Um, my advice is to reserve your tour two to four months in advance, maybe as early as six months. Um, no earlier, no later. Um, the tour is um, somewhat tricky to get in. It's very limited spaces. So you send an email to uh, on the form that's on that website. Um, it's in Italian, so you might have to use Google Translate. Um, but you request the time. The other advice is to be as open as possible. Um, if you're going to be in Rome for a week, give them every day that week if you can. Um, before you schedule anything else, say, I can be on the tour with these many people um, and include their names, their ages. Um, unfortunately, no one under 14 is allowed. Um, and uh, uh, the total time that you can say, I can go any time in this, this whole week, um, that, that really increases your chances. Um, and then finally, uh, I would advise requesting a seminarian as a tour guide. Um, we still have seminarians there giving that tour. Um, and uh, while you can get a very, very good tour from a non-seminarian guide, there are some who are not um, as focused on the spiritual and the religious side of things and are more focused on the historical and the artistic side of things. Um, so if you're especially looking for that experience, um, I recommend going to um, a uh, or requesting a seminarian for that uh, for that tour. Um, so let's see. Uh, I'm going to see. I don't see any comments with questions. Um, and as I uh, check my email real quick to see if anyone's submitting them that way, um, I don't see any there. Um, so I'm going to stay on for uh, another minute or so um, to see if anybody has um, questions. Um, this video should be available just like the rest of the mass, um, just like our, our, our normal mass videos. Um, and uh, so it should be able to be viewed uh, at any point later on. Um, so thank you very much for, um, for joining us for this tour. I, I hope it was... Uh, informative, um, and I certainly hope that you have the opportunity to um, see this in person um, and to um, be in this incredibly holy, incredibly powerful spot um, where uh, the Apostle Peter rests, um, the rock on which uh, our church was built. Um, so thank you very much. Um, God bless, uh, and have a good evening. <laughs>